evening to everybody joining us today. It gives me great pleasure and immense pride to welcome you to our fourth Race to Zero Dialogue Day. Today, we are focused on the power of water to really deliver on our net zero climate ambitions. My name is Kate Lamb. I am the water lead for the Climate Champions team and the co-host uh, for the day today. I'm going to give you a couple of minutes of housekeeping rules and then we'll move into the main part of the day. So I'm, we have pulled together an amazing agenda. It's really quite jam packed. We have three thematic sessions, three spotlight sessions and eight breakout sessions over the day. It is a full and rich agenda. And as such, as MC for this morning and my colleague Maggie, who will be MCing a little bit later on today, we will be ruthless with our speakers. Uh, so you please forgive me uh, if you see my face popping up every now and again and appearing to be rude and cutting people off. We must ensure that we get through the day and grant everybody the respect and time that they deserve. And of course, you as participants are also keen to see what everybody has to say. The event is recorded and live streamed on YouTube. We have over 500 people already registered for the event and we anticipate many more joining us throughout the day. The Zoom platform will be on continuously running throughout the day, so please do keep this open even when you go into breakout sessions. When those breakout sessions are announced, we will be putting a new link to the breakout sessions in the chat of the Zoom, so please don't worry about getting lost at any time. You're really in safe hands. Please do engage with us via social media. You can check out CWE, IUCN, AGWA, CDP, and the UN Global Compact's Twitter handle. Basically, anyone with a three, four, or five letter acronym <laughs> is involved in the day today. And please use the hashtag race to zero so that we can capture all of your amazing content. So we're very pleased to be able to offer French and Spanish in multi, um, simultaneous translation today. If you look on the bottom right hand side of your screen, you will see a globe. It's a globe icon. If you click on that, that will give you the option of switching the language in which you're hearing. Finally, we have a Mentimeter running throughout the day, and this will be set up to continuously capture your commitments and your comments, your pledges, and existing or upcoming campaigns and initiatives that either yourself or your uh, organizations have got coming up in the year ahead and on the road to Glasgow. Now, it gives me great pleasure to announce and introduce our two fabulous champions. These two men have dedicated their lives to delivering changes for the world on climate change. And they're now going to talk to us for a few minutes to introduce the whole concept of the Race to Zero day to day and to share a little bit more insight into their views on the world of water itself. So we have Gonzalo Munoz, who was the, uh, he's the climate champion from Chile. We have Nigel Topping, the UK's climate champion. So over to you, please. Well, thank you, Kate. Um, given that you're going to be ruthless, I better get straight on with it. Um, um, well, first of all, welcome everybody to day four of the Race to Zero Dialogues. This is day four of nine, and today we're focusing on water, but also on oceans and coastal zones. Um, I mean, I'd just like to reiterate Kate's thanks to all the four and five letter acronyms. So CWE, IUCN, CEO, Water Mandate, um, AGWA, CDP, and the Global Compact. And we know there's many other amazing partners working really hard to convene this important set of dialogues. I can tell you that Steve, who's been working with everybody in the background, just shared on WhatsApp, the water guys are amazing. So, you know, that's a community, really impressive job. Thank you. Um, I think both Gonzalo and I um, are really keen to elevate the role of water in in this conversation and, and, and plan of action for systems transformation. It, in, in many ways, water is the key systemic link to a global response to climate change, both in terms of mitigation, and Kate's been teaching me just how many emissions are associated with the water system, but I think even more importantly in terms of resilience, which is really about how do we take people from fragile, vulnerable lives to resilient lives and livelihoods, which is why later this year we're going to be um, launching a, a sister campaign on resilience, so water will really play a key part. Um, I, I, I've been a big advocate of elevating the role of water for Sometime I joined CDP in 2007, and one of the first things I did was work to 
um, put together and launched the, 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 I think we called it the water disclosure project then, but we ended up calling it CDP water. But you know, so it's wonderful to have Kate, who's been leading that work at CDP for um, a long time now, um, help, helping lead the, the theme within the champions team. So thank you for, thank you for taking on two full-time jobs, Kate. I don't know how you do it. Um, uh, I mean, and today, I keep saying the race part of race to zero dialogues is really important. This is really urgent, but the dialogue part is also crucial. That means bringing together people with different points of view from different parts of the system, different parts of the world and, and listening to each other respectfully so that we learn. Um, our objective is to keep ratcheting up our collective ambition. So by the time we get to Glasgow, um, we um, can be confident that we're on track to an entirely sustainable global water sector with ambitious policies and large investments. Some of you will have seen the entire UK water system committing to net zero 2030, all 11 companies. Um, it's that kind of really bold action we need. It's not the time for incrementalism really is over. Um, so we, we really need that, that clear long term goal and then the very clear commitments to short medium term actions in the next five years. Um, that's why this idea of pathways, which we're publishing for each one of the Marrakesh partnership themes, is so crucial. Um, with that, um, let me hand over to my good friend and crazy early morning riser, Gonzalo Munoz, in the middle of the night in Chile. Gonzalo. Thank you, Nigel. Thank you, Kate, and, and the, the amazing water community. And thanks, uh, and good morning. It's, it's definitely great to be framing the future of the water sector, as you said, Nigel. This is absolutely critical. I mean, life does not exist without water. And, and, and during this year, we have seen even uh, more uh, how much of it is not only important to sustain life, to allow us to flatten a curve like the COVID one, uh, but also how much of the water crisis is absolutely unfortunately embedded into inequalities and therefore there are so many things that we need to solve uh, and, and one of it being of course all of the aspects related to, uh, to, to climate change. Uh, we of course expect that all of the relationships or, or, or between water and energy uh, means that uh, all of the water management system should be embedded into uh, emission-free energy and hopefully not only working towards uh, net zero, but net positive in terms of climate. Uh, we, we know that there is a very concrete challenge that requires us to conserve all of our fresh water sources over the next uh, decades. So we can have half of, of the fresh water ecosystem and inland water, not only protected, but healthy and productive by 2050. And meaning it's not only for human life or human productivity, it's also for the other millions of species that live with us in this amazing planet called Earth, right? And, 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 and we need to uh, do that in a way that also, as, as, uh, well, as Kate has taught you, and we have been learning uh, water systems in, increase their capacity on sequestered carbon and at the same time protect biodiversity. The, there's, a, there's a huge uh, potential that, that sometimes we diminish and simply sometimes we don't know that it's related to uh, wetlands and peatlands and mangroves that are absolutely a crucial part of any kind of effort that we need to do around tackling climate change uh, and, and that valuable research, uh, research is something that we have to position in the very top of, of the pile of the work that we need to do uh, worldwide. And, and, and also we have a very concrete challenge around water and sanitation services that need to be of course affordable and available for all, but also need to help us again, as I said, to um, tackle all of the aspects around equity and fairness uh, as, as they are absolutely connected to the climate crisis. So back to you, my friend. Yeah, Gonzalo, I, I hope that's something we'll really explore today is um, the, the, the fact that water, equity, fairness, vulnerability, resilience are systemically all inter, intertwined and 
we really need to make sure we don't just have a set of green new deals or build back better plans in the in the global north but we need a, a blue and green recovery and, and it needs to be global you know we know that the water industry can provide vast numbers of green or blue jobs in the coming decades um, we know that um you know water is the first line of defense for covid it's the it's, it's the, the ultimate form of ppe is fresh water to wash your hands um and we, but we also know that there's you know huge opportunity to improve very inefficient agricultural practices and, and, and yesterday on one of the youth panels there was a um we had a, a, a young engineer from south africa just reminding us how much um in that part of the world the uh you know water really is making the lives of smallholder farmers much much more fragile so there's a lot of work to be done there i think um also really importantly i have a sense that there's growing momentum from governments and again you know i know that the eu's passed new legislation um to create a six-fold increase in the amount of water reuse in agriculture that's a significant multiple um you know we're all hopeful that the a new biden administration will reverse rollback of water protections introduced by trump and we know that china's got water security second only to energy and carbon in their um their sketch for the five-year plan coming out i think next april I, I, so i think we also we all need to work really hard next year of course as well as the climate cop and the biodiversity cop we have a uk presidency of g7 and a italy presidency of g20 and with the us coming back into the multilateral system we need to make sure that that sort of global blue green recovery is financed um uh, both public finance but also mobilizing the vast amounts of private finance that will be needed so I think we need you know, part of our job is, is is working with this fantastic community to elevate the importance of water and to and to and to make sure it's not a standalone, but it's it's part of that nexus of health, jobs, climate, um, and that water is one of the enabling factors for all of those. Yep, and 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 as you said, it's not only about mitigation; it's also about resilience. We're seeing how how many of the uh, governments are are taking the lead, but there's also a lot of uh, momentum being built around the non-party stakeholders. They are moving into the right direction. They are understanding that there's no way we can not only produce, there's no way we can live without water, but also understanding that it's so precious that we have to be extremely efficient. Uh, so it's becoming more and more uh, a crucial part of any kind of global discussion in any type of, uh, uh, of topic that we're talking about, the race to zero emissions. Uh, we are seeing companies, great growth in the last couple of years, a number of global companies and cities that are reporting on water uh, through organizations like CDP. Uh, when it comes to, to the work of the cities, from Salt Lake City to Dar es Salaam to Berlin, all adopting very noisy solutions to water reuse, recycling, and sustainable water management. We're seeing like it's unacceptable that we continue throwing the the uh, the sewage to the oceans or to the rivers or to the lakes. I mean, this is something that we have to change dramatically and very, very fast. And, and also, of course, this year, coronavirus has taught us so much about how to address these challenges uh, in a way, in a, collective, uh, in, a, in a collective way. It's like, of course, it's related to many of the topics that we work around. Uh, radical and inclusive collaboration is absolutely essential. But wait, in this case, 145 states around the world share river basins to uh, so so they need to work together there's no way they're going to solve it without working together and that means a uh, very strong diplomatic uh, um, collaboration so this is why we're absolutely excited about opening today's theme of water as as part of this incredible series of events but as, as we said as one that enables life enables everything that we are capable and that we have to do around not only mitigation, but also resilience. So, Kate, thank you, and back to you. Thank you, Nigel, and thank you, Gonzalo. It gives me uh, goosebumps to hear some of these words coming out of your mouth. It's, I'm so pleased that we've got such two passionate champions uh, of our cause here. I'm really confident that we're going to be able to shift the dial in the year ahead, and I look forward to working with you both on that. So thank you. Um, it's now my job to introduce the next section of our day, which is to hear from the, the leads of our main partners involved in pulling the day together. Allow me please to introduce Torgny Holmgren, who's the Executive Director of CWE, or the Stockholm International Water Institute. Stuart McGuinness, who is the Global Director of Nature-Based Solutions at IUCN. And John Matthews, 
who's the executive director of the Alliance for Global Water Adaptation. Please, over to you, Torgny. Thanks a lot, Kate, and welcome all to this Water Day. It's an honor for Seve to co-convene this day together with IUCN, AGWA, Sea Water Mandate, UN Global Compact, and CDP. And I'd like to thank the high-level champions and the teams we just heard of, Nigel and, and Gonzalo, and especially to you, Kate, being the water lead, for your leadership in igniting the global movement for climate action on the road to Glasgow next year. Water is, as we all know, the key to achieve all the SDGs and to build a zero carbon future in a holistic and sustainable manner. As we grapple with all the challenges as of today, be they social, economic or health, it is critical that we build back better, leaving no one behind. And in short, to tackle the climate crisis and also handle the pandemic, we must build resilience faster. And that will also be the theme for the next World Water Week arranged by CV in August 2021. So thank you and welcome to this meeting. Thanks. Thank you, Torgny. Stuart, you are on mute. You would think after, you know, 21 weeks of this, you would get it by now, but <laughs> <laughs> so we'll let that be a warning to all of our other speakers. <laughs> Hey, uh, thank you very much, Kate, and thanks for the heads up that I was on mute. Uh, hopefully this, uh, it's, it's better when you can hear me. Um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to, to all of you, wherever you may be. I'm speaking on behalf of the IUCN uh, Director General, Dr. Bruno Oberly, who would have liked to be with you today, but uh, is recovering at the minute from COVID-19. And he's asked me to extend uh, his best wishes to all of you. As an intergovernmental union of both state and non-state actors, IUCN is delighted to be a partner for this important day as part of the Race to Zero Dialogues under the Marrakesh Partnership. Now it's been stated many times that the focus now must be on viable solutions. And I'm confident that over the course of today, we will see wide ranging set of actions and commitments from the water community that signal clear progress towards a zero carbon resilient future. It is now critically important that we identify and promote tangible evidence-based initiatives that demonstrate the growing opportunity and ambition of commitments by non-state actors and can also be translated into practical lessons for others to replicate, scale up and further develop. We know that water is a key component to other climate pathways, including land management, restoration of ecosystems and nature-based solutions, energy and industrial production. In this respect, water management is both an opportunity and a challenge. Uh, for example, when water is treated as an unaccounted externality, it is often used as a sink for pollution. And that pollution can directly impact the efficacy of other climate pathways. Pollution limits our ability to reuse water or requires that we use more energy to clean it. Pollution is also wasteful. It means we tend to extract more from existing water sources or tap into fossil groundwater to make up for the shortfall. We therefore have no option but to capitalize on the circular nature of how water flows through our environment and our economies to develop sustainable options for all se sectors. Today is not just about ambition, and I think this has been highlighted by, by the, two, uh, the two champions, but it's also about connections and synergy. It's now time to work with many others from outside the sector to foster a broad community that can better understand and have the wherewithal to utilize water as a key building block in the race to zero emissions, as well as a key enabler for climate change adaptation. Finally, we must protect our water, our sources of water. Nature provides the water we need, but we often forget our water sources and how they need protection, restoration and management. They too are directly impacted by climate change. And we hope that the protect and restore focus of the climate action pathway for water drives attention and commitments to put nature centrally in the race to zero. Thank you very much. Enjoy the day and I look forward to the outcomes. Good morning. Uh, good afternoon. Good evening. My name is John Matthews. I'm with AGWA, the Alliance for Global Water Adaptation. Uh, I want to e echo the uh, the uh, uh, welcome uh, and uh, to all the participants. I see a lot of names of uh, friends and colleagues from around the world. Uh, and uh, uh, Agua is very excited and humble to be participating uh, in uh, this event and to supporting this broader initiative. 
uh, under the Marrakesh partnership. It's not easy to really tell uh, and show the story about why water is critical uh, to a, a climate change more generally, uh, but I wanted to tell a very brief story. A few years ago, I was in South Asia uh, and uh, with a colleague uh, from the British government, uh, we were meeting with an energy minister uh, uh, in, in a, a province uh, of, uh, of this, this country. And uh, the, the minister was very reluctant to see us. He thought we were going to push something on them that he didn't want to hear. Uh, and when he finally led us into his office, uh, he said, you must be here to talk uh, about greenhouse gases. Uh, and my colleague and I looked at each other and we said, actually, uh, we don't care that much about greenhouse gases. We're not here to talk about that. He was puzzled by this. He said, oh, then you must be here to talk about the environment. And uh, my colleague and I looked at each other and we said, actually, we're not here to talk about the environment either. Uh, he said, why are you here? I know it has something to do with climate change. Uh, and uh, I, I jumped in and I said, well, I understand that you're building a very large coal-fired power plant, one of the largest in Asia. Is that right? Uh, he said, yes. Uh, uh, he said, uh, I, I said, uh, it's a thermal plant. Uh, how is it cooled? He said, well, it's water, of course. Uh, and I said, where does water come from? He said, it comes from a canal. And I said, no, it doesn't come from a canal. It actually comes from one of the great rivers of Asia. And all of the water that's in that, uh, uh, in that river comes from snowpack uh, and glaciers up in the Himalayas. And they are under very rapid uh, evolution uh, because of climate change. You're sitting in a city that in the past uh, 10 years has experienced a century scale drought followed by a century scale flood. Uh, There's 67 million farmers in this province. My question for you is uh, uh, when those farmers during the next drought uh, come to the prime minister and they ask for water uh, uh, and you need water for your uh, 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 for your facility, who's going to get it? And he was very quiet and he leaned back and he said, now I know why you're here. Uh, and I think that highlights the, the uh, clear gaps that we have, the interconnection uh, that uh, we need resilient water management as a systemic uh, solution uh, across sectors, uh, uh, across uh, uh, public and private, uh, 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 and across adaptation and across mitigation. Thank you very much. I think you'll see some really good examples of these kinds of cross-cutting examples over the course of the day. Thank you, John. Uh, it's really great and very powerful storytelling there. I hope we'll have some more like that throughout the day as well. Thanks for joining us so early. Now we have a couple of videos. I would love to hear from Cardinal Tex and from the Holy See. Oh, we have it, wonderful, thank you. Uh, good morning to all of you and uh, all of you participants at this uh, event on water. Uh, and very grateful for having been invited to, to participate in this event. We're very grateful for your, for your invitation. Conversation about water is always a very significant, very meaningful thing to us. Not simply because, for example, I come from Africa but it's because of what water is for all of, all of humanity. It's the one element that we cannot live with, you know, without. And so when people go into space to other planets, the first thing they're looking for is a sign of water. If there's water there, then there's the assurance of life and all of that. So it's very crucial for us. But it's also very important that in a conversation about water, as for example, you know, the poops have always been reminding us, it's good, it's good that we come to this conversation with the wisdom of our very many traditions, including religious traditions. And that's why, for example, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to quote again uh, from the teachings of the popes that water as a created element is not limitless and it's not inexhaustible and it should not be used with absolute sense of dominion, which we tend to exercise over a lot of created sense because the nature of water is not that. It's rather something that calls for very judicious use, recognizing that even its spread over the surface of the earth is not even. 
Some areas of the earth are more endowed. Other areas are deprived actually of water and live in very you know, dry you know, uh, uh, conditions. Therefore, the recognition that water uh, exists in such a character on the surface of the earth invites us to, in this case, you know, the SDGs call for equal access to water, portable water for all, and we try to pursue that. But it's also good to recognize that when, for example, Pope Francis in his encyclical allowed out to see, talks about integral development, he draws attention to this. It's an invitation for us to recognize that the elements of nature and the elements of human life are interrelated. To support human life, we need a healthy nature, healthy creation, healthy ecology. And for healthy ecology to also continue to survive, we also need human conduct that's also saintly and godly. So the two go hand in hand. On account of this, I'd like to you know, congratulate you to holding this in Siwi in Stockholm, where you've been holding a lot of events on water. And I'd like to refer to the 2016 conference that was held over here, at which we drew attention to integral develop the concept of integral uh, development, and at which it was observed that the most, uh, the, most of the contribution of water to integral and sustainable development is something that we cannot overstate, and it should not come to us as an after afterthought or an oversight. Indeed, the water cycle, water function within the water cycle, its variation within the water cycle is a big factor in our climate change. Climate change is essentially, if you want, an issue of water. Okay, it's an issue of water, its variation within the water cycle, its absence or its presence and all of that. Therefore, it is good we are coming together to make this uh, you know, uh, conversation to recognize one thing which Pope Francis has later written about in his encyclical Fratelli Tutti. There he says that those who enjoy a surplus of water and yet choose to conserve it for the sake of greater human family have attained a moral stature that allows them to look beyond themselves and to look at their brothers and sisters. And the key word over here in the Pope's quote is conserve, conservation. And I like to make three observations about this. We conserve water not simply for the future, but we conserve it in terms of its quantity, its quality, and its access. Access not only to us, but access also to those who will come after us. So a gen intergenerational use of water. We conserve water also for its use within our own, you know, the group within which we live. And inclusive access to water is also very important and a good thing. Then thirdly, we conserve water also because, uh, because of, you know, of what the very many uses of water and religious uh, functions motivate us to do. It's used in a lot of purification rites, in a lot of rites of passage, but for us Christians, it's also the greatest symbol of the Holy Spirit, the power of God, which enables us to develop virtuous disposition, virtuous uh, qualities, and which enables us precisely to respond to the call to conserve water and to save it in the light and in view of those who will come after us. So we thank you, dear, sincerely for this invitation and trust that you have a good conversation. Thank you. I'd love to introduce Vedika Bandekar. She is Water.org's Chief Global Impact Officer, and we'll be hearing from her for a brief few moments before we have the video available to you. Thank you. Thanks, Vedika. Thanks, Kate. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, all. Uh, many thanks to CV, IUCN, AGWA, and other organizers for inviting Water.org to this very important and timely conversation. Uh, I would like to focus my brief remarks on the link between the on ongoing pandemic and climate justice. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has underscored the importance of water and sanitation uh, to the health and resilience of both the global community as well as the global economy. The entire world today understands how hand washing is the primary weapon to prevent the spread of the virus. However, hand washing is of course impossible without access to water. Today, 2.2 billion people, which is six times more than the population of the United States, live without a household water connection, meaning 
that their ability to protect themselves against this pandemic is severely constrained. Similarly, uh, social distancing or physical distancing, another requirement to keep yourself safe is that much harder to practice without a toilet or indeed a water connection at home. Meanwhile, we cannot talk about such safety precautions with, without considering how a changing climate impacts both the existing sources of water as well as people living in water stressed environments. It's deeply disturbing and really sad that those who contribute least to climate change are suffering the first and are suffering the most. People living in poverty are among the most vulnerable to the impacts of climate change because of their reliance on unstable water and sanitation systems, uh, on weaker institution protections, as well as on limited access to finance. Compromised long-term water supplies are a, if not the critical factor in clim climate migration. The impacts of climate change on water and sanitation systems are undermining progress towards achievement of SDG six by pushing communities down the ladder from safely managed to basic or even limited service and increasing the financial gap for the world to meet our targets. Not only do we need new climate resilience solutions to water and sanitation problems, we also need to have many more actors involved in solving these problems. And we need to find new ways to pay for these solutions. The status quo is just an insufficient to meet the challenge we face. Innovating financing approaches, including new forms of bonds, such as green bonds, blue bonds, catastrophe bonds, uh, micro lending, micro insurance, favorable taxation strategies, all of these need to be adapted to the context and put to work for the people, communities, and cities that are threatened. The pandemic has underscored that you cannot separate water and sanitation from health or the prevention of disease, or indeed even from healthy economies. When one person is at risk, we're all at risk. In summary, addressing the unequal access to water and sanitation in ways that are resilient in the face of climate change will ensure that we maintain the needed balance between people, ecosystems, and the economy. Thank you very much, and back to you, Kate. Thank you, Bedeker, and thank you, thank you for your really hard work. I know it's a, it's a wonderful job that water.org do, so thank you. Um, we're going to try that video again from Matt Damon. We'll see if it works. If not, then we'll head straight over to Peter. Martha. Hi, everyone. Matt Damon here. Drought, food scarcity, extreme weather. That's not just the stuff of science fiction anymore. It's our current reality. And unless we act now, it's only going to get much, much worse. Around 15 years ago, I got some great advice from President Bill Clinton. He said, turn toward the problems you see. And that idea is important now more than ever. The problems we face today are many, and it's a whole heck of a lot easier to put your head in the sand and go about living your life than actually confront them. Hanging over it all, both in terms of the scale of the problem and the potential it holds in solving many of society's biggest problems, is climate change, which is an existential threat to the planet and humanity and why we're gathered here today. Now the good news is I've seen firsthand that it is possible to make progress when you turn toward the problem, even when it seems impossible. Here's an example. More than two billion people don't have access to safe drinkable water and as a result over a million people die per year. But the problem is actually much bigger than that because it's also robbing millions of women and children of their future potential, their true potential. And with climate change, water sources are drying up and those walks are getting longer and sometimes simply futile. Now, I've been on those walks with kids who should have been in school. And through the organizations I co-founded, Water.org and Water Equity, we've empowered more than 30 million people with safe water or sanitation. And that progress could be wiped out if we don't get serious about climate change. The scale of the climate crisis is just staggering, but you can't let that be an excuse for doing nothing. So to fight climate change, we can't be overwhelmed by the seeming impossibility of the task at hand. We don't have the luxury of ignoring it if we want to build a better future for our children and grandchildren. And the potential impact of making even incremental progress cannot be understated. Every decision we make now, every action we take, and every commitment we make 
has an impact on the world that the next generations are going to inherit. And it is incumbent upon all of us to ensure that it's as good of a world as the one we enjoyed. The key to solving any of the problems we face, but especially climate change, is working together to find and implement solutions that can make a difference, both in the near and long term. Thank you. Now we're going to hear from Martha Rojas Orego, who's the Secretary General of the Ramsar Convention on Wetlands, one of those amazing potential solutions that we're going to shine a light on today. Thank you, Martha. Thank you very much, Kate. Um, and thank you to the high level champions for organizing this event. And thank you for this introduction, Kate, which uh, actually uh, says what is the focus of uh, the messages that I'm going to share today. So as we know, the, the ambition needs to be raised substantively and we need to find uh, solutions that are concrete, feasible and effective. And some of these solutions we find in nature. And we know that there is research that shows that we could achieve one third of the emissions reduction needed to achieve two degrees uh, Celsius using these solutions, but we are using only 1%. And within these solutions, I would like to focus on a particular type of ecosystems, the water-related ecosystems or wetlands. So these include freshwater and marine and coastal ecosystems, such as rivers, lakes, peatlands, marshes, mangroves, and coral reefs. So I would like to explain why these ecosystems are so important for the race to zero. First of all, these are the most effective carbon sinks that we have. And take an example, peatlands. Peatlands cover only 3% of the surface of the land, and they store twice as much carbon than all the natural forests in the world. Mangroves, they store five times more carbon than other tropical forests per hectare. So these ecosystems are really hotspots for mitigation. Secondly, uh, and Gonzalo mentioned that as well, uh, they are very important in terms of resilience because wetlands act as sponges that keep water and release them, and thus they prevent droughts and floods. They also protect the coasts from extreme events, which we know have become more frequent with climate change. And this is particularly important as we know that 90% of natural disasters are water related. But wetlands are also the source of fresh water. It is the most important source of fresh water that we use for consumption. Uh, they also clean water. And in that respect, they are very important for adaptation and for a healthy human life, which as we know today is absolutely essential. So we also know that they provide other services in terms of biodiversity, in terms of the source of food, etc. However, Despite all these values, wetlands are also the most endangered ecosystem today. And I don't think that we are, and, and the public is aware of that. So we have lost in the last 300 years, 87% of the global wetlands. And we're losing them today, three times faster than forests. So this means not only that we are losing these amazing sinks of carbon, but it also means that this carbon is being released. So we are creating more emissions as these ecosystems disappear. And to give you an example, again, with peatlands, peatlands, the peatland degradation today is responsible for up to 5% of the global emissions. So to finalize, we have here a great opportunity, and Gonzalo mentioned that this should be on the top, to have a ready-made solution. We know that it works. We know how to do it. So it's really a very important solution to use the conservation and the sustainable use and restoration of wetlands as part of the climate change action plans. A key action is to include these ecosystems within the NDCs. And some countries, not many, are doing it, but we are seeing that countries such as the UK, Spain, Chile, Uganda are already taking efforts, seeing that there is a win-win opportunity to conserve these ecosystems as part of the climate change policies. And this, in this way, we are thus accelerating our efforts for climate change, at the same time reversing the biodiversity loss and ensuring that we are building back better and that we achieve zero carbon sustainable and a resilient future for all. So thank you very much.
Thank you, Martha. It's encouraging to hear that there are reasons to be cheerful, but we certainly can't be complacent when it comes to wetlands. So I'm really looking forward to diving more into this topic later today. Thank you for such an impassioned speech. Now we have a video from Ulrika Modia, who's the UN Assistant General Secretary at UNDP. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to address this important forum of the Race to Zero Dialogues. And I want to commend the team of organizers for ensuring to highlight the important role of water in addressing the global climate crisis. Climate change affects water in so many ways, threatening basic human needs, it has implications on the human rights to water and sanitation, the status of vital ecosystems, as well as economic development. Some 4 billion people face severe water scarcity for at least one month per year. And when disaster strikes, it often strikes through water, floods, landslides, storms and droughts that are becoming more frequent and more intense, as we know. Most countries are well aware of the risks and the importance of building adaptive capacity. Among the 137 countries that include adaptation in their intended national determined contributions to the Paris Agreement in 2016, water was the most important area for adaptation action. And many of the largest water-related programs of UNDP are also found in the climate change adaptation portfolio. Water management also relates closely with climate change mitigation. But this reciprocal relationship has been given less attention. Few institutions and actors responsible for updating and implementing national climate change strategies have fully taken water-related mitigation issues into account. The importance of water for climate change mitigation does not only relate to the way that mitigation measures like nature-based solutions for carbon sequestration or updated energy mix towards hydropower or biofuel rely on water, there is also the greenhouse gas emissions of the water sector itself. And water and wastewater utilities are reportedly responsible for between 3 and 7 percent of greenhouse gas emissions, relating to both energy consumption and emissions from wastewater. UNDP and partners, not least the Stockholm International Water Institute and other co-organizers of this day, are actively supporting countries to purposefully consider the interactions with water in their endeavors to enhance their national determined contributions to the Paris Agreement. And UNDP's climate promise, which is the largest and boldest global initiative on climate change, is helping 115 countries to deliver stronger commitments under the Paris Agreement. We are, as UNDP, supporting dozens of countries who have chosen to strengthen water-related emissions reduction and adaptation measures. All this needs to happen while we are also fighting the global crisis of the COVID-19 pandemic. And with over 100 million more people being pushed into poverty in 2020, the COVID-19 crisis has painfully, as we know, exposed the deep inequalities and fragilities of societies. And while hand washing remains one of the most critical lines of defense against the spread of the disease, UNICEF points out that 40% of the world's population or 3 billion people do not have hand washing facilities with water and soap at home. And one in four healthcare facilities lack basic water services. So among the priorities of multi-sectoral crisis management, UNDP calls for improved access to basic services. World leaders coordinated by the Sanitation and Water for All have called for a making water, sanitation and hygiene available to everyone eliminating inequalities and leaving no one behind. Now, on the ground in 170 countries, UNDP will continue to work closely with partners to pool resources and know-how to end the exclusion of the poorest and most vulnerable from the most basic services, and to build forward better a green recovery that ensures cross-sectoral collaboration in a way that puts our future on a sustained path towards carbon neutrality. Let's race to zero. Thank you. Thank you, Ulrika. I hope you've all got your running shoes on today. I'm about to hand over to our final speaker of this plenary session. It gives me great pleasure to give the floor to Professor Johan Rockström, head of the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research. He's going to help us understand better the evidence base for acting on climate through water. Thank you, Professor Rockström. 
Okay, thanks, Kate, and uh, hello, everyone. Basically, what I'll do is provide scientific support for all the voices that have already been expressing the urgency and the need for a transformation towards sustainable water for humanity's future on Earth. Matt Damon um, put forward the expression, we're facing an existential risk. I just want to emphasize that this is scientifically supported today. We are at risk of destabilizing life support systems on Earth, fundamentally fresh water being a precondition for the stability of the planet. As Cardinal Turkson and Nigel Topping and Torgny Holgrim pointed out, this is not water playing a single sector role. It is interwoven in the fundamental fabric of social, ecological, and health and security across the world. Now, what I'd like to do is just walk through a few of the latest scientific advancements in our understanding on the role of freshwater as the bloodstream regulating the state of our future on Earth. The number one is that for the first time, we've been able to run climate models over the last three million years. You may wonder, is that of relevance? Well, it is for two reasons. One is that even though our planet is 4.5 billion years old, it's only in the last Pleistocene era, the last 3 million years, that we've had a planet with a global hydrological cycle, with the phosphorus, nitrogen, carbon cycles, with the biosphere composition, ice sheet compositions, as we know it and we depend on it today. Now, for the first time, a climate model has been run based on our physical understanding of how the Earth system works. And it shows that despite all the climate forcing and all the volcanic eruptions and earthquakes, the planet has kept itself within an incredibly narrow corridor, never, never exceeding two degrees Celsius. So despite all the punches through natural variability, minus four degrees Celsius compared to pre-industrial mean temperatures means deep ice age. 70 meter lower sea levels, tremendous droughts across the entire planet, plus two degrees is the maximum warm level we've seen on Earth. And the planet has been oscillating within this corridor for the past three million years. Do we really need more scientific support that it's dangerous to go past two degrees Celsius? Well, we are on a journey that has taken us to 1.2 degrees Celsius, and we are moving towards three to three and a half degrees Celsius, a point we haven't been in for the past 10 million years. Now, what has this to do with water? Well, we know today that the reason why the planet is able to stay within this incredibly narrow corridor, minus four ice age, plus two warm interglacial, is thanks to all the biosphere feedbacks that keeps the planet stable, meaning all the carbon sinks, for example, the wetland sinks that Martha just shared, all the abilities of the freshwater cycle to keep carbon stocks intact and to suck up and absorb and dampen when stress occurs and releasing when um, we have periods of shifts in the forcing on the earth system. So we can say with very high degree of scientific certainty today that if we have a stable hydrological cycle, we stand a chance of having a stable biosphere, which is a prerequisite for a stable planet. 50% of the global emissions of greenhouse gases today are brought, are absorbed by the natural biosphere in the oceans and on land. So freshwater is fundamental. The second insight is that the global freshwater cycle is a global common. We all depend on it. The latest science, which my colleagues at the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research published just a few weeks back, showed that global warming has now reduced rainfall to an extent in the Amazon rainforest, one of the big biomes that regulates the state of the Earth system, with so much that 40% of the forest can today exist both as rainforest and savanna. Not that the rainforest has crossed the tipping point, but it can because we have the hydrological conditions now for it to be either in savanna or rainforest state. As you may know, the latest assessments show that if we lose 20% of the rainforest due to deforestation and continue global warming, we are on a pathway towards irreversibly losing the Amazon rainforest, this massive system 
for fresh water supply to cities like Sao Paulo and also regulator and global climate. The second uh, key insight is that water plays a role in interconnecting different tipping elements on Earth. So when ice melts on Greenland, it affects the ocean heat circulation in the North Atlantic, which affects the monsoon systems in West Africa, which affects the temperature on surface water in the southern hemisphere, which in turn makes the surface water so much warmer that West Antarctica melts faster. So there's an interconnectivity through fresh water from the Arctic via the Amazon and West Africa to Antarctica. You can really talk of an intertwined system. I want to close here, Kate, by just giving three tracks of how water can help solve the climate crisis. Track one, which is actually building on what Martha just shared, safeguard the irrecoverable carbon sinks in the living biosphere. We have recently mapped this with colleagues at Conservation International. 139 gigatons, billion tons of carbon are stored in what we now call irrecoverable carbon in living ecosystems. These are defined in a very conservative way. These are the living systems that we have a chance to manage, which if we lose the carbon cannot be recovered in the next 30 years, the decisive period when we are to decarbonize the world economy. Now, 139 gigatons is equivalent to 15 years of global emissions. If we lose these carbon sinks, we can no longer have any chance of delivering on Paris. Now, the second, so that is a climate solving strategy to connect the climate agenda with the water agenda, with the biodiversity agenda on, on preserving those standing uh, carbon sink systems. And we know them. These are the temperate forests, the boreal forests, the wetland systems, the mangrove systems, uh, the large tundra permafrost stocks. We have them well mapped today. The second track is the massive evidence today that nature-based solutions or natural climate solutions can be scaled. Investments in soil carbon sinks, in biomass systems, all of them depending on freshwater investments shown to be possible, able to contribute up to 30% of the climate mitigation pathways between now and 2050. Nature-based solutions can be scaled and it's all about working with nature through water. And third and final, Kate, is the strategies of building resilience in food production systems, which is also automatically a way of reducing risks of pandemics into the future. Because now we've come to a point where we can no longer expand agriculture into natural ecosystems because that raises the risk of creating pandemic risks such as COVID-19, which is a zoonosis, a virus spillover from wildlife through domestic animals to humans. Now we know, for example, in Africa that 95% of the food production is rain fed among small scale farmers. Here, global warming is undermining the life support systems for small scale family communities across the continent. Investing in resilience building is about investing in water. We have so much experience here. Sweden through CEDA and SIWI have invested over the years in water harvesting strategies, which can now be scaled as a way of drought proofing small scale agriculture. Let me tell you a little story. 20 years back, we started to transfer over water harvesting experiences from India with Sunita Narain, one of the uh, Stockholm Water Prize laureates over to Africa. That has started to build up a momentum on an experimental research basis to start with. I was back in Machakos in the eastern part, just 100 kilometers east of Nairobi, just a few months back, meeting with the farmers there uh, 20 years after the investment. And can you imagine the water harvesting ponds today with locally made lining, serving both drought proofing of maize cultivation, but also as a, a, a women led uh, off season cash making vegetable garden uh, source have now become so precious that what 20 years back when you married your son or daughter, the dowry paid for that was generally uh, some livestock. Today, the highest price for dowry when you uh, marry 
uh, away your daughter to a, a, another family is a water harvesting pond. A water harvesting pond is what you want as your most precious capital when you con combine families through marriage today in Machacos. This is proof that uh, water harvesting is a pathway to drought proofing under climate stress. So in summary, water is a precondition to reach the Paris target. Water is a precondition to reach the United Nations new targets on biodiversity. And the water is a precondition, as has already been emphasized many times, to reach the sustainable development goals. So it's really time to start scaling the solutions. Thank you, and back to you, Kate. Thank you, Johan. It's really inspiring, and thank you for your great stories. Now, if those of us on the call today, if you if you haven't quite figured out why we're here, then maybe you need to go back to the beginning. If this hasn't convinced you of the need to act on our issues, then again, go back to the beginning and watch again. Um, please do join me in thanking all of our inspiring speakers in this opening part of our Water Day. It's really been a powerful start to the day, I'm sure you will agree. The virtual claps, please, for everybody.